All right, Chair Bailey, we are now live and you can begin. Great, I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask the recording secretary for the roll call, please. Thank you. So Chair Bailey? Here. Vice Chair Minor? Here. Member Rodemall? Here. Member Weisendorf? Here. Member McQuella? Member Atkinson? Here. And Member Sapp? Here. Let the order reflect that all members are present minus McQuilla. Great. Um, uh, we have a couple of housekeeping things I need to tell you about. I need to remind you to keep your audio unmute unless you are speaking, okay? So we don't get background noises. Um, the staff will remain muted until they need to speak. And as members of the public join the meeting, they will be participating as an attendee. So they will, their microphone and camera will be muted also. So only today's panelists will be viewed during the meeting. And if you're calling in from a telephone, this is speaking about the public still, and you choose to speak during the public comments portion of today's agenda, for privacy concerns, the host will be renaming your viewable phone number to resident and the last four digits of your phone number. Right. And I'm going to ask the recording secretary now to explain how comments, public comments will be heard at today's meeting. Thank you, Chair Bailey. At each agenda item, the item is presented. The chair will ask for committee member comments and then open it up for the public. The host in Zoom will be lowering all hands until public comment is open for the agenda item. Once the chair has called for public comment, the chair will announce for the public to raise their hand if they wish to speak on the specific agenda item. If you are calling in to listen to the meeting audibly, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. The host will then call on the public who have raised their hands. Public comment will be limited to three minutes and a timer will appear on the screen for the committee members and public to see. Once all live public comments have been heard, the meeting host will read emails submitted. If you provided a live public comment on an agenda item, but also submitted an email, your email comment will not be read during the meeting. Additionally, there is one public comment period on today's agenda to speak on non-agenda matters, which is item two. This is the time when any person may address the committee on matters not listed on the agenda. And this will be turned back over to you, Chair Bailey. Chair, so I now see I call for items number two. Is that right? Yes. Public comment on non-agenda items. Uh, we are now taking public co comments on item two, not agenda matters. This is a time when any person may address the committee on matters not listed on this agenda. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Do we have anyone? No, and there's some kind of background jabber going on. Somebody has a radio on or talking to their spouse. Oh, interesting. I can hear it too, but it's, it's, um, it's not me. It's not you. Everybody else is muted. So maybe it's a public person. Uh, no, it's yeah, it's not the public. Um, okay. Any ideas? Give us just a moment. All right, it looks like the sound has stopped. Um, so we'll go ahead and turn it over to our host um, to give the instructions for public comment. Thank you. A countdown timer will appear for the convenience of the speaker and viewers. The first speaker will be acknowledged and invited to speak when the countdown begins. Please make sure to unmute yourself when you're invited to do so. 
Your microphone will be muted at the end of the countdown. At this time, I see no hands raised and there were no email comments mailed in. Okay, great. Then let's move on to item three, which is approval of the minutes for the special meeting that was held on October 24th, 2019. And I'd like to need, I need a member of the committee to make a motion to approve of the minutes from the special meeting on October 24th, 2019. Motion to approve. Great. And then we need a second. I second. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to scheduled items. Uh, to the, the next one is this report on the fiscal year 2019-20 Measure O annual report. Thank you for so we will be going through the measure of presentation. I believe it'll come up on the slideshow. And um, I'm just going to turn this right over to violence prevention. It should be on slide number three. The map on the slide here shows each of the new zoning districts and shades of Good afternoon. Could you all hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Magali Tellez, and I am the new community engagement director. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about myself since I will be overseeing the violence prevention partnership. And thank you for this opportunity. Um, aside from some of the information that we're going to be sharing this afternoon, I wanted to let you know of the projects um, that will be taking place as well um, as we respond to our community through not only violence prevention partnership, but through the city of Santa Rosa's empowerment plan. And two of those new items that uh, we're going to be exploring, uh, you know, moving forward towards the year uh, is our ethnic studies with the COP program, uh, which is a partnership between Santa Rosa PD, as well as our recreation department and our community engagement department. We uh, are holding a pilot program for a distance learning uh, site. Uh, we have 12 to 15 youth grades three to six, and it's a six week pilot program that we hope to have more information uh, once we wrap up towards the end of this, uh, this fall for you all. Um, we're gonna survey the youth and see how impactful the program has been in terms of, of you know, any impact it's had on a youth relationship to law enforcement and if it's been able to help us create a bridge uh, for our community. Another program that we have is um, the Santa Rosa PD Lowrider Patrol Car, and that's going to be used as an engagement tool. Uh, we are working on, we've procured a car that's another partnership with the Santa Rosa uh, Police Department. We have the vehicle and we will be working with a community organization, the Sonoma County Lowrider Council, um, that will be helping us put the, um, the patrol car together and we'll be using that for community outreach events. So um, I just wanted to give you all a, a quick update, introduce myself as well, and I will hand it over to my colleague. Hello, my name is Jason Parrish. I'm the Administrative Services Officer working with both the Recreation and Community Engagement Divisions. So on the first slide, number four, would just like to call your attention the beginning fund balance of 1.36 million with the ending fund balance of about 998,000. So it shows we're using fund balance of around $365,000 with a program that Measure O will continue for another few years. And the intent is to be able to use that fund balance so that as the Measure O concludes, we don't have a large fund balance. We're using the monies for direct services. Uh, the other thing I'd like to call your attention to on this slide is the reserve for encumbrance and project commitments. So that represents uh, basically the fact that our choice grant program is on a calendar year. And so this shows roughly half of the total annual expenditures uh, that were remaining after January 1st and will continue. And if you could advance the slide. 
So, and to give you a little bit more detailed breakdown, uh, what you'll see here is that the uh, personnel make up roughly half of the overall violence prevention programs. Uh, within the salaries, what you also have is $160,000 in temporary employees, and those are the seasonal employees that work out in the field for the Recreation Neighborhood Services Group, uh, providing direct services. And then you also have the choice grants in this case, which by the measure O is required to be at least 35% of the violence prevention portion. Uh, right now, a little bit higher than that. The administration is the overall citywide uh, uh, financial allocation that goes into the violence prevention program. And if you could advance the slide. And as you could see here, um, we go through an annual rebalancing as we progress through the budget, looking at what our long-term revenues are as well as our expenditures so that every year we try and make sure that those two meet up. And right now we are a little bit over in the expenditures over revenues based upon the current projections. And so right now, community engagement and recreation are both working on those to determine whether or not our programs at the end of the year will be what we thought we had start out the year with uh, outside of COVID. And I believe it's moving to the next presenter. Chair Bailey and members of the COC, Jason Carter, Violence Prevention Manager, part of the Community Engagement Office. Um, as you can see, staff continue to participate on local and statewide initiatives, such as the California Violence Prevention Network, uh, the Funder Circle, Circle Health Action, Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council, Keeping Kids in School Committee, and many others to ensure the city's efforts are consistently communicating and collaborating with various projects and strategies. Also in September of 2019, Gang Prevention Awareness Month launched the annual Violence Prevention Annual Seminar, uh, which was titled Managing Trauma to Build a Resilient Community with over 180 in attendance, discussing strategies and how to best serve those that have experienced trauma. Uh, some of the breakout sessions included gang identification and local emerging trends with Santa Rosa Police Department, strengthening partnerships with school districts and supporting students with Santa Rosa City Schools and self-care for direct service professionals with Child Parent Institute. Some of the other events included a youth basketball tournament, uh, tournament in partnership with Neighborhood Services with over 300 in attendance, Community Actions South Park Day Night Festival, as well as the West Ninth Night Walk for Safety with SRPD and LifeWorks. Uh, this occurred during such a unique time, not too long after the Jacobs Park shooting incident. Also during this particular fiscal year, the partnership began the planning stages of expanding upon the Gang Prevention Awareness Month model by creating the first annual Violence Prevention Awareness Series. That's a series of, of monthly events uh, launched in January of 2020. The year started off with supporting uh, a training for Brookhill parents, as well in, as engaging Cook Middle School students with open conversations with law enforcement officers. But unfortunately, in March, we had to table some of the events and we'll be retooling uh, for fiscal year 2021 and look forward to sharing the outcomes of the first annual VP uh, awareness series at the next immeasurable annual report. Also in the upcoming slides, happy to provide an overview of the choice grant programs and guiding people successfully. Next slide, please. Cycle nine of the choice grant program funded nine nonprofit organizations that ultimately served over 15,000 youth uh, and families in Santa Rosa through various activities and trainings, such as land paths, summer programming with arts, crafts, and reading, um, and Child Parent Institute with Triple P Positive Parenting Programs. And of all the uh, incredible services delivered by the city and our nonprofit partners, 93% of those services were provided to youth with 7% to young adults and parents. Also in alignment with the strategic plan and community safety scorecard, 
100% of the activities were delivered in areas identified as underserved with 40% of these events in fiscal year 1920 uh, specific to the Roseland areas. And some of these events included a Sole night with community actions, uh, various student engagement workshops, career readiness curriculums, um, and nature walks among others. Also, one of the many projects staff is involved with is capturing some of the historical data and outcomes and the impact of Mesuro, uh, which produced an, an incredible amount of $10,210,572 invested into local nonprofits and schools since the launch of the Choice Grant Program in 2006, as well as over 270,000 in mini grants to support one-time projects that occur throughout the year. Next slide, please. The Guiding People Successfully Referral Component is, um, has the partnerships wraparound coordinator position receiving referrals from probation schools, uh, various nonprofit organizations, uh, where that person completes an intakes and brings a case review to a multidisciplinary assessment and referral team in order to coordinate referrals for the wraparound coordination of services. Uh, the MDART, as we call it, uh, consists of all choice funded agencies that regularly meet and track services to families in need. Uh, leveraging local Mesuro dollars, GPS has been funded by the state over the years through the Board of State and Community Corrections, initially through the CalGRIP grant, and then more recently through the California Violence Intervention and Prevention Grant, also known as CalVIP. Um, as noted, this funding also includes additional pass-through funding to two local agencies that prioritize services for GPS referrals. Uh, with this additional funding, LifeWorks of Sonoma County delivered bilingual family-based intervention services in the home with both the youth and the parents, focusing on family engagement and utilizing behavioral health strategies. And also Social Advocates for Youth provided intensive case management, work readiness workshops, uh, and paid work experience while utilizing motivational interviewing strategies. Unfortunately, the CalVIP grant officially concluded in August of 2020, but after uh, many conversations with Sonoma County Probation, the city was able to secure funding for the wraparound coordinator position through the end of fiscal year 2021 to continue wraparound coordination to families in need. And, and I just wanted to provide uh, some statistics uh, from uh, some of the GPS outcomes, which include on uh, this particular fiscal year, 96 unduplicated high risk slash at promise youth and 51 of their family members were provided wraparound services, as well as 62% of youth that participated in career readiness workshops showed an increase in a positive youth justice domain, such as community work, education, and health assessments. And, and one uh, final data point also, since launching the GPS program, uh, GPS has provided 5,718 one-on-one -on -one services uh, through June 30th of 2020, uh, which include pro-social activities, crisis intervention, and various trainings for youth. And with that, I will turn it over to Recreation Division Director, Kelly Magnuson. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Kelly Magnuson with Recreation and Parks. I'm happy to present our direct service programs today. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, recreation serves mostly school age youth, but we are a large employer of high school and college students as well. So um, starting in July 2019, that July splits our summer. So we start off um, in June with our uh, recreation sensation program. We continue it through July and that serves about 130 youth per site. Last summer we had four sites. And then we roll right into the fall with um, our sports programs. And last fall, we were really fortunate and we got cooperation from several schools for their gym space because the city doesn't have their own gym. So we were really excited to work with Roseland Accelerated Middle School, Comstock Middle School, L.C. Allen High School, and Santa Rosa Middle School for the use of their gyms. And we were able to offer our basketball program, futsal, cheerleading, and those are all really successful programs. And then 
um, one of the things that we experienced last fall was the Kincaid fire, which made us shut down our, our programs for several weeks due to the um, schools being closed and the smoke in the air. So that was unfortunate. But we came right back from the holidays and we started up again with our sports and our um, community programs. We had um, eight neighborhood sites focusing on after school programs uh, that included arts and crafts, homework assistance, community events, nutrition, recreation activities. And those went all the way until March when the pandemic hit and we had to shut down all of our programs. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. So for the month of March, we, we were just regrouping and trying to figure out what could we do to serve our youth um, with the shelter in place. So our staff worked really quickly on pulling together a, a virtual tutoring program uh, we had 12 temporary staff work with about 35 students over the virtual, uh, doing their virtual ass homework assistance, and, and that proved to be a really popular and successful program. We did that through the end of the school year. While we were, while we were doing the, the tutoring program, our uh, full-time staff put together a summer program called Better Together. This was a, a five-week, full-day summer program at Burbank housing sites, but we were only allowed to have 12 youth per site and because that's how many were allowed for the health order. They were called cohorts. So we had um, these, these different groups of kids that were with us all day. So we were providing daycare, recreational activities, sports for just a small number of kids. And it, it was really, really a lot of work because we had to do the social distancing, protocols. We had to do the temperature checks daily. Uh, we had to follow all the CDC guidelines. Uh, and then um, after we got into a few weeks of that, it was going really well. So we added on two more cohorts at the Finley Community Center. So um, we got a lot of experience with how to do day camp uh, during the summer. And so we decided to move into our our next fiscal year, which started in July after the, those programs shut down, we moved into a distance learning full day program at both of our community centers. So that's what we're doing now and uh, looking into the future. Um, we're really dependent on what's going to be allowed per the Sonoma County Health Order, but our staff is very resilient and willing to regroup and currently we're serving 120 kids. Uh, at the distance learning program and about 75% of them are from, from underserved families and are really needing a lot of our help. So um, that's it for me and um, we can move on to Jason Parrish who's going to talk a little bit more about what we're looking forward to as we move ahead. And if the slide could be advanced please. So part of what uh, both community engagement and recreation have had to work through uh, is what do operations under COVID look like? And so as you could see here, we started out the year with a little bit under a million dollars in reserves. Um, what is being estimated right now based upon our actual revenue collections projected out is to have $283,000 by the end of the fiscal year. That looked at the original budget pre-COVID, we established for fiscal year 2021. So we, both community engagement and recreation are in the process of reevaluating programs and grants, as well as the composition of the total program uh, to see what strategies we could use moving forward. So thankfully, we aren't going to have to be using these in the current year, uh, but what we would be looking at, and the committee has received in the past, is the 35% for choice funding uh, right off the bat. In the past, the Violence Prevention Partnership has had to adjust that amount down to meet uh, lower revenues. So that's one option. With the neighborhood services and the recreation programs, it would have to be evaluating the ability to continue funding all of the programs uh, that are currently being performed. And both units 
While these are Measure O programs, also have general fund components to them that supplement or provide additional programming. And so with the community scorecard, that's a very long process um, that the community engagement is currently working on to move forward. And with the mini grant program, because of the calendar year, uh, the next mini grant program will be coming out in January. And so all of those issues are going to have to be on the table as we see about the last few years of the Measure O program moving forward. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, as we go back to slide six, um, it talks about the revenues and the expenditures. And so I do see that right now the expenditures is more than the revenue. So will that, with that being said, will that cut the actual programming or will there be loss of jobs or do you foresee um, the sales revenue coming in? Sorry, this is Jason Parrish again. And what we are having to evaluate is the current year expenditures. Uh, with COVID going on, as we found out with recreation, they have uh, very intensive needs. And I'm pretty sure violence prevention has also experienced with their nonprofits that their expenditure needs uh, have been high. Because of the nature of the program in recreation, the only program that we have are the field services that we provide at each of the different Burbank housing sites. So we would have to look at possibly cutting a housing site on the community engagement site because the measure requires that we spend 35% of the money on grants. The remainder of the violence prevention program is all in staff. And that is once we get a better handle on what the mid-year revenues will be for both sales tax, and it will give us the first half of a full COVID year of operations. We'll be able to reevaluate those in January or February to see how much, if at all, uh, we would need to uh, adjust each of the programs to meet the financial restraints. Okay. So um, moving forward then, um, once you do that reevaluation, I did hear that they did tutoring. They also did um, some programming at some of the sites. Would that, to make up the 35%, would you increase those programming at those particular sites or would you venture out and do other sites? Uh, right now, uh, in discussions with uh, Kelly Magnusy, it would have to be an evaluation of the overall uh, need in the community and where those locations are specifically uh, would be cited. And that is community engagement and the violence prevention partnership works with recreation on those. So I would like to be able to give a more definitive answer, but if Kelly would also like to comment. Okay, I think you can hear me now, sorry. Um, so we, we continually evaluate how we are gonna provide programs. Uh, we would like to be back at the Burbank housing sites full time. There's eight sites, um, that includes our Apple Valley site. We'd like to have our full sports program in action simultaneously. It just really depends on what, what the health order allows. Um, but we are, we are budgeted to do those, those programs um, currently. So um, I'm not sure exactly what you're, what you're asking at this point. Could you, could you ask me the question again? Yeah, well, in, in respects to if we stay in COVID, are you gonna revamp the programming um, to meet those needs that is needed in the community. So it, it may look different, you know, will you continue to do it social distancing um, through Zoom? 
there are other options. So I'm just curious, did you look into the other options if we continue to stay in the purple or red or whatever color we're in right now? We will continue to change with the needs of the, the, the youth in, in the, the school situation as well. Um, if the schools go to a hybrid model, we'll adjust and we'll, we'll do programming for the, for the kids who are out, out of school. We might go back to after school programs. We might do the full day program. But as, as long as the community centers are closed to the general public and we aren't allowed to have senior services and we're not allowed to have rent the rooms for gathering, we can repurpose the community center for the underserved youth programs. But we, our hands are kind of tied with our numbers. We aren't allowed to have groups larger than 14 kids in a group and we aren't allowed to offer sports right now. We can only do trainings. So we, we just have to be prepared to um, change with the health order and then we'll open up more and more programs as we are allowed to. But um, uh, there's, there's a lot of kids out there that need us. And so we, we're able to shift and, and revision programs as needed. Okay. And um, for the total number, sir, I just want to clarify on slide eight, it says the total um, served youth is 15,000 and some change. So that's for the whole two, um, since the program been in existence, correct? Vice Chair Miner, this is Jason Carter. No, that's just specifically for cycle nine. Great. Oh, okay. Thank you for the clarification. And then also um, you mentioned the wraparound program um, and it's, in place until 2021. And so what will that look like? Uh, will you can revamp everything to take a look and see how you can continue with the wraparound program or will it you know, dissolve in 2021? Jason Carter again. Um, so unfortunately that, that particular component of the partnership has, has always been funded by state grants and you know, it's been an ongoing partnership with the state and Sonoma County Probation to kind of keep it going. If you remember a couple of years ago, the Mesro Citizens Oversight Committee had approved a six month stopgap to where we did not have funding. We were able to identify funding and then we received the new state funding. So I think a similar philosophy will be um, adopted in from, you know, as on an ongoing basis. We'll always be looking for additional funding, whether that's through the state, whether that's through different foundations, um, we, we are trying to, again, capture all of that measure of data because it, it's, a, it's the, the match piece of obtaining external grants has been proven to be critical for us. And so uh, we'll be, it's a constant uh, evaluation of what's available and what's appropriate for the city to participate in. Okay, thank you. And then my last question is on slide 13 in relation to the unaudited reserves. And I just wanted to make sure I understand that com uh, completely. Can somebody re uh, review that or give me a definition for unaudited reserves? Yes, this is Jason Parrish again. Uh, so when the city closes out its books uh, at the end of June, the new fiscal year starts, there is an auditing process that staff goes through for another month to close out the books. And that's what you see is the unaudited reserves. Uh, by, I believe it's January or December 1st uh, following, an outside auditor, auditor will come in and review the city's books. And then at the end, they will make any audit recommendations and the final closeout will happen. So for all intents and purposes, though, this is the final balance at the end of the fiscal year. Okay. And that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Jason, I have a question. Do you have, um, does the city know yet how much revenue has been lost because of um, sales tax loss because of COVID? That would be a better question for Shelly Riley, uh, the city's budget manager. So last fiscal year, we went down about five and a half percent from 1819, fiscal year 1819. Um, because of the delay in sales tax, it's actually paid out two months after um, the month closes. 
We don't really have that great of a gauge of what's happening for this fiscal year yet because I believe we've only had two payments. Um, when I looked at those very briefly, um, they were lower, but they weren't drastically lower, um, but we really won't know for another couple more months, to be honest with you. Okay, thank you. But So when we come back in March, April to do the budget, we'll have better revenue um, estimates for not only the end of this year, meaning 2021 and next year, 21, 22, and that's when we would adjust anyone's budgets to um, make these cuts to programs, personnel, et cetera, if necessary. But at this time, it's too early to say whether we will absolutely have to do that or not. Okay, thank you. Jason, I also wanted to, oh, before you move on, um, I also wanted to mention that um, uh, Magdalena has joined the meeting and if she can turn on her camera if she's here. So she could be seen as Hi, Magdalena. Hi. Good to see her. Your baby's with you? No, I'm in my office. Oh, okay. But I will have to drive to get them soon. So you can see the inside of my minivan too. <laughs> it was good to see you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Sorry I was a little late. It's okay. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, Jason, I wanted to ask you a question. You, you mentioned something about $10 million was the, uh, the amount of money that's been, um, I wonder if you could tell me about that money. Was that, the, was that just the Measure O dollars or is that Measure O plus general fund or is it Measure O plus general fund plus money that has come in from all the different grants that have been able to be received um, because of all the programming that we have? Um. If I could ask a question, I just want to make sure, are you um, uh, asking Jason Parrish or Jason Carter? Oh, thank you for straight, <laughs> I forgot about that, Jason Carter. Chair Bailey, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, there I am, Jason Carter again. Um, I, I believe that is a combination, um, but it is the total sum of the grants distributed to the nonprofits, uh, both through some of the general fund allocation, but mainly through Metro. Oh, okay, but that doesn't include all of the money that's come in with other grants that have that you've all been able to get over the years. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So state funding. That's a, a, a we look at that as a, a different allocation of, of mm -hmm. revenue, and so we we didn't include it in the specific Metro dollars. But okay, um, as always, we are you know communicating to the public that without the local Metro funds. Uh, we wouldn't be even eligible for much of the state grants that we have received in the past. Right. That's what I was, I wanted to hear. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Uh, I'd like to keep Jason Carter on the hot seat for one more second, if I could. Um, Jason, it's, it's, it's Mark Stapp. Um, it, this is a broader question. Um, the Choice Grants Program touches such a nice cross section of, of nonprofits in the, in the city. Um, are you getting any anecdotal evidence about how many of them are going to have to or are thinking of or might have to suspend operations as a result of, of their, their own budget issues? Member staff, uh, staff, this is Jason Carter again. Um, I, I don't want to speak for agencies, but I can tell you what the city has done uh, to prevent exactly what you had mentioned. Uh, through the Choice Grant Program, uh, especially once the COVID impact was, you know, here and, and, and initiating, we did accept modifications in all services um, for the original contracts and intended outcomes. We uh, wanted to make sure that our nonprofits are, were adjusting, were, you know, conforming to all of the, the questions and the chaos that, that was happening back in March. And so we delayed evaluation reports, but at the same time, we continued with the original payment timeline, so our CBOs would not have any additional gaps in funding. Um, as, as far as um, uh, across the board, like you had mentioned, I, I, I'd rather not speak for particular agencies, but I do know that you know uh, most, if not all, of the, the agencies are still in existence, but I know that some have scaled back, some have modified, uh, but all are very, very much appreciative of the efforts that uh, the city has participated in with our measure of funds. Thank you. Anyone 
anyone else? I have a question. Manza Atkinson here. First, I'd like to uh, thank you for the work that you do for the for the city of Santa Rosa through the violence pre prevention. Um, a lot of people benefit from a lot of people, a lot of families benefit from these programs. Uh, I have two questions. Can you, can you elaborate? I think it's not Jason Carter, the other Jason. <laughs> um, it is Jason Parrish. Jason Parrish. On, you, you mentioned that expenses had increased during COVID. And I was wondering if you can elaborate and provide a few examples of how expenses had increased. The second question. Hey. Okay. Ooh, sorry, go ahead. Second question is, you know, I see, you know, there's the COP program, there's the Rider Patrol, there's a lot of athletics. Uh, what about STEM, STEM uh, programs? That's it. Um, I will answer the uh, first part, and I would actually ask um, uh, Kelly Magnuson, Deputy Director of Recreation, if she would be able to address the second part, um, as well as supplement my initial answer, is that the experience that recreation is having is during COVID, we have been trying to uh, continue first the support for the kids and are engaged in our program, uh, but is especially trying to supplement the work that the schools are doing. So making sure they're doing their homework and what the experience of staff has been is the additional stress out there in the community. Uh, there's been several articles in the Press Democrat recently reflecting this is requiring a lot more resources as far as ensuring that the kids are able to focus, that we're consulting with teachers as well, the protocols in place for being able to ensure that we could do a viable uh, you know, COVID-based operation, if you will, uh, is, is very intense. As uh, Kelly Magnuson mentioned, we can do up to a 14-person uh, class overall, but that requires constant cleaning throughout the day. If the kids want to go outside, we have to make sure there will be an environment or a playground that has been cleaned. And so those types of activities make the uh, overall resources required for the uh, ongoing programs to be higher than you would expect if a program was actually, you know, we had fewer kids in the program because of COVID. Hi, this is Kelly Magnuson again, Jason, I think you answered that really well, but what I can add is that um, many of the youth that we're serving in our current program are extremely challenged uh, with the distance learning. And so this, I think it, we have four schools that have referred students to us. Uh, for, for our assistance in the program. And we've had to hire extra staffing to assist those youth. So where we might be able to have two staff in an after school program with 25 kids, we've got three staff with a program of 12 kids because the, the needs are so great in helping the kids throughout their school day. So the cost has gone up. In addition to that, we have the uh, sanitation staff uh, that it's required to run, run this program. So um, the, the desks are cleaned every couple hours. The kids' temperatures are taken each morning. Um, it's just, it's a real rigorous program to keep the safety protocols in place. And so that's costing us more money. I hope I answered your question. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? 
I have a quick, what I think will be a quick question. Um, this is member Rodarmel. I'll say it because I know that it's an intimidating last name for people. <laughs> um, I, I could see from the report that there are obviously systems in place to measure the effectiveness of many of these programs. And I was just wondering uh, if those are available to review anywhere, just curious about you know, how we're measuring the effectiveness of the programs that we are funding and making decisions about what's most helpful to our community. Uh, member Road Darmel, hey, Jason Carter again. Um, we contract with Upstream Investments from the Sonoma County Human Services Department, same department that also released the portrait of Sonoma and oversees the Upstream Investments portfolio to do our evaluation. So uh, we don't have a, a full year's data yet, but once we do for this particular cycle, we can certainly send that off to you. Um, our previous evaluators also provided uh, metrics in how our agencies have produced outcomes in comparison to the original scope of work, and, and we're more than happy to send that to you, and to the entire um, COC. Thank you. Anyone else? One more, one more question. The, okay. the science, science programs. I, I say this because I have a background in science. <laughs> uh, so I was just curious, you know, it's nice that the kids, that uh, the community gets to engage in athletics, but what about uh, STEM programs, science, engineering, math? Um, this is Kelly Magnuson again, and we do try to bring in uh, contract instructors into our programs to offer some of those enrichment programs. Uh, Recreation also offers a kids science after school program. It just started today at the Church of One Tree. It's not uh, funded by Measure O, but it is a it is a program that's offered to the community. We we do offer a Lego engineering camp during the summer that's open to the general public. So um, Recreation tries to have several offerings in in all those topics throughout throughout the year, but specifically Measure O is funding. Um, after school uh, direct service programs and now the distance learning program and the sports programs, but we try to bring components of enrichment into those programs, if that makes sense, by bringing in some outsiders and some guest speakers and having little mini series within the, within the program itself. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. I, I, I just wanna thank everyone in the uh, Recreation and Parks and uh, Violence Prevention Partnership. It's, I know it's, it's hard work to begin with. And then with COVID and the fires that we've been experiencing, it's extremely hard. So thank you for all the flexing that you've done. Particularly, I was so pleased to see the, an after, I mean, a school program put together so many parents who just don't have the bandwidth to, they can't even be home. And so I know there were probably a lot of children, there still are, that are just home with, um, you know, had with just trying to do school by themselves and that's really hard. So thank you for stepping up as much as you have and I'm, hopefully there'll be more opportunities, more funding to come in that can, can help us support those uh, who need it the most. But thanks for all your hard work. You're here. Okay, so now we move on to the next piece. Is that right? That is correct. It looks like a uh, fire department is now up. Hello, this is Tony Gosner. Can you hear me? Sort of. Can you hear me better now? A little bit. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Tony Gosner. I'm the fire chief of the city of Santa Rosa. Major has been just a great thing for the city. Uh, as it relates to the fire department, and you'll see that in our presentation today. 
Jim Arend is our administrative service officer. He's going to go through the financials. And then Deputy Chief Scott Westrope will go through the operational portion for uh, the city. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Arend. Thank you. Okay, we're on the first slide. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see, this is the talk about the fund balance where we go through the revenue and, and expenditures for the year that just passed. Um, we've got a little different situation. We started with a fund balance of about $3.1 million and due to COVID sales tax revenues took a pretty good hit. So um, they came in lower than anticipated and our expenditures are pretty much stayed the same or where we expected. So we ended up eating into our, our uh, reserve balance by a, a roughly $24,000. And that's for part of the time of a 3 million 97. Um, next slide. These are our expenditures. Um, as you can see, the, the lion's share of the expenditures are in salaries and benefits. Roughly 84% of it is spent on that. Um, and Due to a, um, the, the, basically the ones that have gone up, salaries were up about $58,000 due to a contract settlement last year that brought the, rent, the, the um, salary costs up. And we had a drop in overtime based on strike teams not being as active last year. Um, benefits were also up about 113,000, mostly only, uh, not mostly, exclusively related to CalPERS. Um, that was a pretty big hit we took at that. And overall, our expenditures were up about $196,000 based on the salaries and the benefits. Um, next slide. You'll see the, the line with our revenues and expenditures. And I think the first thing I'd wanna point out is you'll notice for us, uh, it's the first time in five years that revenues have actually dropped below expenditures. Um, we've been, done a pretty good job of keeping them above, um, and, and that's by design. Um, we've been slowly putting fund balance aside every year so that we're able to um, fund future fire stations. That's part of what we're hoping to do. Um, so that's what you're seeing there. Unfortunately, with this year, that kind of, we took a small hit of about 24,000. Our sales tax revenue was down $218,000 and our expenditures were up 195. So overall, the, the net for the year is we, we ended up about 448,000 below what we, um, revenues, expenditures over expense. Um, and that was the hit we took on our fund balance. Next slide is Scott. All right. Good afternoon, uh, Scott Westrope, Deputy Fire Chief with the City of Santa Rosa Fire Department. And just briefly, we're gonna talk about some of the uh, positions that Measuro provides uh, to the community through the Fire Department. Um, the positions that we have that are generated out of Measuro are three fire captains, which are frontline supervisors on uh, the engines and ladder trucks that you see on the streets. We have one fire captain who is dedicated to our training division. So that's the uh, captain that manages our training facility there on West College. Three fire engineers, which are the uh, operators, apparatus operators that you see driving the uh, various fire equipment around town, and three firefighters. Measure also funds 25% of our EMS battalion chief, so our emergency medical services battalion chief, um, to manage the oversight of our EMS, paramedic, and DLS programs. And then it offers the paramedic incentive pay for the six firefighters who are the paramedics on our two ladder truck companies. So a few years ago, uh, due to Measure O, we were able to upgrade our ladder trucks to advanced life support services. Next slide, please. Some of the positive impacts that Measure O has had on the fire department to provide better service to the community is it's uh, provided the nine firefighters and training captain that were mentioned in the uh, previous slide. It's also provided the, uh, the staffing for incentive pay for three engines and tr two truck companies uh, to be paramedic units. So they provide a higher level of medical service. Um, and with that comes the enhanced uh, EMS management through the partial funding of the battalion chief. About 65% of our calls for service are uh, medically related. So it's, it's most of what we do. And so it's, it's really important to have those personnel in place and to have the, uh, the management oversight in place for that program. 
due to the uh, the personnel, the stations, and the equipment that Measure has provided, it's improved our response times and the deployment of our resources. It's reduced fire loss and improved the EMS uh, outcome for uh, medical patients that we respond to. It's increased our ability to uh, reach out to the community and be a, a stronger member of the community. And then of course, it financed the uh, Station 5 construction. Next time, slide, please. So these are the fire stations that Measure O has provided funding for construction on. Fire Station 10, which was completed in uh, 2008, which is the uh, slide on the top right. Fire Station 11, which was uh, completed in 2009. It serves the, uh, the JC neighborhood um, down on the bottom left. And then Fire Station 5, which was completed in 2015 on Newgate Court in Fountain Grove, which is on the bottom right. It no longer looks like that, as you uh, may have seen. We unfortunately lost that fire station in the Tubbs fire, and we're currently working on reconstructing Fire Station 5 at a different site. Next slide, please. Some of the equipment that uh, Measure O has provided, uh, two Type 1 fire engines, which are the uh, fire engines we drive typically on a day-to-day -day basis, which you'll see in the top right corner, engine 10 there is a Type 1 fire engine. It's provided one Type 3 wildland firefighting engine, which is uh, the engine you see on the bottom left there. Um, obviously, that engine's got a lot of use this year. Four command vehicles, which you obviously see in the, uh, the center of the screen there, and then one swift water rescue trailer such as some of the equipment that Measure has provided to provide uh, enhanced service to the community. And with that, I'll turn it back over to ASO Aaron. Okay, next slide, go to 24. Um, this is looking ahead at where we're going to be at the end of this current year. Um, as you see, there's at 3,097, again, the starting point. Um, we are actually gonna be in a deficit this coming year as well up to the tune of $476,000, which will bring our reserves down to $2.6 million. And it should be pointed out that the, the reduction is the 476,000 was really principally driven by the um, sales tax drop that we experienced due to COVID. Um, for fire and measure O, that, that came to a roughly $611,000 of that 476. So um, it's a pretty big hit we're taking on that. Um, and we're fortunate that we have reserves that we can tap into. Um, it is not what we designed or what we had hoped to do with the reserves. We really were hoping to have some money left over for fire stations and each one of these is just taking a little bit away. It's kind of like when you have a savings account and you're having to dip into it because of unforeseen things. Um, that's what you're seeing right here. So um, the, the takeaway is we're still anticipating to have the estimated reserves at the end of this current budget year of $2.6 million. And with that, we'll open up any questions. I have a question um, on slide 17. Uh, I mean, can I get some clarification on the transfer out debt? The transfer out is the debt service that we paid when we were, we had a bond that we that we took out or a, to, to fund the construction of fire station five. That's what that is exclusively. It's all debt service. Okay. And in relation to the new fire station, we talked about this at our last meeting. And I know you were supposed to be looking for a new site. And where are you in the process of that? Do you have any potentials? And then the next question in relation to that is the funding that will be coming from Measure O. And that's on, I'm sorry, slide 21. Sure. Uh, this is Scott Westrop again. So where we're at on the uh, purchase of a new site for the new fire station five, um, we're currently in a CEQA process. Um, we've purchased a piece of property from a private company in Santa Rosa. We're moving the fire station down off the hill for a couple of reasons. It's coming into a, a better spot to serve our strategic plan and our standards of coverage that will provide better service to the um, north end of Mendocino area. And then it also provides still rapid service to the Fountain Grove area. So it's in a better spot for our response times and, and service delivery. It's also a safer location for a fire station. It's not at the top of a, 
a hill or a draw or a valley, it's, it's, it's down in a low lying spot. So um, it's a little bit more fire safe, um, relatively speaking to the Fountain Grove area. Um, and so we're, we're essentially in about a year long CEQA NEPA process, and then we'll work on breaking ground after that. Um, so we're making good do progress you, there. I'm sorry. Do you still have the, I'm sorry. Do you still have the temporary one that's up there? Is that still um, in place? Correct. So the temporary fire station five was put on the old fire station five side at 3040 Corkerdale Road. Um, there's a temporary structure there and service has been restored there for quite some time. So there's still service delivery up there. It's just been a much uh, more laborious process to rebuild a new station five in a new location than we had anticipated. And we're really working with the city on, on funding. Um, there's obviously not going to be enough money in, in Measure Road to fund the construction of a fire station. It's somewhere between 12 and $15 million to build a new fire station. Um, so we're going to work with uh, pg PGE &E settlement money, uh, general fund money, and other ways that we can bring in some revenue to rebuild that fire station. So I, I don't anticipate um, us using Measure O to build the new station five. You say you don't anticipate using Measure O? I don't, just because there's, with three with less than $3 million in our reserve fund balance, and the need for 12 to $15 million, we're going to have to find another revenue source for uh, building fire station. And then my last question is re in regards to, you know, with the construction that we have going on in our city, and I know there's going to be uh, exponential growth of um, apartments in that area. And so will this fire station be able to handle the additional housing that's coming in? Yeah, that was that was forecast in our strategic plan and our standards of coverage was uh, the increase for uh, housing, particularly on the north end of Mendocino Avenue. And so the new fire station site, which is at the corner of uh, Stagecoach Road and Fountain Grove Parkway, brings it much closer to the north end of, of Mendocino. And so it actually will improve the response time for both the, the initial arriving unit and the subsequent um, assembly of a full alarm assignment if there was a fire there. So it actually is in a better location to provide better service to those areas. Okay, thank you so much. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Okay, then. Thank you very much for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Stay safe. Good afternoon, I'm Pam Lawrence, ASO for the Police Department. If we can advance to the next slide. So this slide shows you our beginning fund balance in our reserves of $1.1 million, our sales tax revenue of $3.8 million, our other revenues of $4,000, and then our expenses of $4.2 million, which meant that we had to dip into our reserves again this year, leaving us a balance of $756,000. Next slide, please. This shows a breakdown of where the money was spent. As you can see, the majority of the funding, 94% was spent on salaries and benefits. We spent about 135,000 on services and supplies, which included maintenance and, via, and, and fuel for two vehicles for downtown enforcement. It included the um, lease for the substation downtown, as well as insurance. And then we spent 112 on general fund administration fees. Next slide. So this shows you a 15 year, um, 15 years since the inception of the program. It shows expenditure steadily increasing, generally keeping pace with our revenues. But as you can see, every couple of years, our revenue um, were, did not meet up to our ex expenditures. So we had to dip into our reserves those years as we're having to do this year. Um, next, next slide, please. Chief Navarro will be presenting the next few slides. Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, Rainer Navarro, Chief of Police. Um, first of all, I thank you for the time right now to uh, allow us to come uh, in front of you to provide this, uh, provide this update. Um, 
I wanted to start off real quick just to let you know, um, give, give you a quick overview of our mission and our vision, and, um, and, and uh, then we'll go into how Measure Row helps support that. Um, our, measure, our, our mission is to uh, make our city a safe place to live, work, and play, and our vision is to be the standard of excellence in policing. Uh, that's a very high bar. And, uh, you know, but uh, we never stop improving or wanting to improve or innovate our services. Uh, this particular slide here, as you can see, uh, we have 19 positions in our uh, Measure Row Fund. And uh, both uh, sworn and civilian staff are, um, are, are uh, used through Measure Row and are assigned throughout the department. Uh, this includes nine officers, a lieutenant and a sergeant, who are assigned to uh, designated specific assignments that address priority issues such as uh, homelessness and, um, um, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, uh, such as homelessness and um, other issues that come up uh, and tr uh, such as traffic and uh, gangs uh, and uh, 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 youth services. Um, these positions are vital to meeting the mission and the vision of our department and also the city council's mission to provide that high quality public service and, a, and, and cultivate a vibrant, resilient and livable city. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So to talk a little bit about the impacts that Measure Row provides uh, to us, it, it really does enhance our patrol services. Uh, in the past, we've used uh, Measure Row to uh, provide equipment or purchase equipment such as electric uh, motorcycles for our downtown enforcement team. Uh, we use it for our downtown office uh, next to the transit mall. And a few years ago, it helped us uh, update our radio infrastructure as we um, uh, our, saw our radio um, or an aging system uh, that we had uh, here for the city. Uh, what we what we do is uh, we do use a strategy uh, as we move forward. Uh, last year, we actually did a uh, uh, five community listening sessions uh, to um, incorporate uh, the community's voice into our strategy. Uh, you know, community policing is not only uh, what we do, but who we are, and uh, we do feel that feedback is truly a gift. Uh, so, what we do, um, what we've done is uh, we found that uh, we continue to see traffic and uh, homeless issues as uh, some of the top priorities for our community. Uh, Measure Row allows our staff to go out and address these specific priorities. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we have uh, officers in our downtown enforcement team that address homelessness and on our traffic team that addresses traffic enforcement. Uh, we've, uh, as you can see, we've had approximately a thousand enforcement contacts that can be attributed to Measure Row officers. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is, uh, this slide will uh, kind of talks about a little bit more of the uh, other issue, other things that we, we handle. Um, and it can be a little bit more difficult to measure some of the other impacts uh, that, uh, that Measure Row helps us, uh, helps us in. But uh, to provide a, just a quick overview, it does improve our response time to, and uh, to local emergencies. You know, this year alone, we have uh, probably, I think nine months out of this last 12 months have been in some sort of emergency mode. And uh, Measure Row staff were directly involved in our evacuations related to the, both the Kincaid and the glass fires. And our Measure Row staff took the lead um, on the onset or at the onset of our COVID emergency by setting protocols and maintaining the equipment for the safety of uh, not only our staff, but for the community at large and uh, have been uh, at the forefront of uh, doing a lot of the uh, checks for businesses um, at the very beginning to, um, to ensure compliance of the uh, health order. Uh, we have a very strong partnership with the Santa Rosa City Schools and also the other school districts uh, in and around uh, Santa Rosa. Uh, our uh, SROs are, um, uh, take a large part of that and they educate staff and students in a variety of areas, uh, including drugs, uh, drug awareness, uh, gangs, alcohol abuse, and they deal a lot with uh, working with students and staff in the area of um, crisis uh, crisis issues and self-esteem and peer pressure. 
Uh, last October, if you remember, there we had a um, uh, an SRO that responded very quickly to a shooting in front of one of our local schools uh, to help lock it down. And uh, that response uh, helped us in a swift and safe resolution to that particular uh, incident. Our, uh, our staff also is involved in, in the uh, youth community police experience, which uh, occurred prior to COVID. And we are currently working on uh, steps to do a virtual community police experience for our students uh, as we continue through uh, the health emergency. Uh, our SROs still get calls to assist with crisis calls for students and facilities uh, where they are engaged with our local nonprofits to help mentor youth and engage uh, the community. Uh, our, uh, our officers have been a part of several community listening sessions over the last several months uh, during uh, um, uh, with uh, Community Action Partnership and several other uh, nonprofits. And as uh, Magali mentioned uh, earlier on in her, in her uh, presentation, our SROs are involved in the ethnic studies with a cop. Um, and that's a collaboration uh, between us, Recreation of Parks, and the Office of Community Engagement. Uh, we also work uh, on homelessness. And uh, that is done with our uh, uh, Measure o officers that are assigned to the downtown enforcement team. Uh, we provide daily referrals to homeless services. Uh, it specifically work with the uh, homeless outreach services team. And uh, we meet on a weekly basis with various homeless service providers uh, to address uh, the homeless issues in our community. Uh, the, uh, we, we have seen an increase in um, customer service. Uh, again, our vision is to be the standard of excellence in policing and Measure O is vital to our staffing model in order to accomplish our mission and vision. Uh, it, it has helped us enhance services such as uh, the downtown enforcement team, school resource, motors, and also meet uh, essential grant requirements to help us in our mission. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I want to, we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, uh, future strategy as we uh, step into 2021. Uh, we have uh, continued to see uh, needs in areas of our staffing facilities and uh, providing innovative programs that are going to meet the needs of our communities. Uh, our uh, city and the department are feeling the financial impact of COVID and uh, we are, uh, we are uh, addressing that with strategies for this next year. Uh, go to the next slide, please. As Pam mentioned, uh, we have been uh, uh, dipping into our, or we have been dipping into our reserves for several years now. Uh, we have uh, seen a rising cost of salaries and benefits. And uh, as Pam mentioned, we have uh, uh, began this fiscal year with about $756,000 in our measure of reserves. The uh, salaries and benefits of our staff make up about 94% of our measure O expenditures. Uh, so in essence, we have uh, run out of money in our reserves to, due to the uh, reduction in revenue. Uh, again, uh, measure O is vital to our staffing model and uh, to address, however, to address the uh, reduction in revenue, uh, we are going to be freezing two school resource, school resource, uh, resource officers positions which will give us approximately $400,000 in savings. This uh, decision was not made lightly. Uh, we had to take uh, into account the reduction in revenue, uh, the current state of our schools, which is virtual in nature. So our uh, SROs are not on campus. However, they are vital in our uh, response for COVID um, and, um, and uh, continuing that collaboration with our uh, school partners. Um, and uh, they are, the school board is continuing to um, look at uh, the SRO program uh, in the future. Uh, with that, uh, we will continue to evaluate our priorities for Measure O revenue based on both the department and the city priorities in the areas of public safety, emergency preparedness, uh, traffic, homelessness, and violence. That concludes our portion of the pre uh, presentation and uh, Pam and I are available for any questions that you might have. So 
Oh, so I have a couple of questions in relation to um, the reserves. So um, since you're dipping into your reserves, my question is in relation to the uh, current employees that is paid out of the out of the measure O funds. Will there any be will there be any cuts or anything of that nature? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so currently we are uh, freezing the, the two positions, which is gonna help us um, with that, uh, that, that deficit. And so that'll, that'll uh, help us with that $377,000 deficit. Uh, and then as we move forward, we are uh, gonna be evaluating uh, what the measure of revenue will look like and how that addresses or how, how that's gonna impact our staffing. But uh, we do have, uh, you know, we, we are, continuing to evaluate, um, you know, how that, how that's going to uh, impact us. Uh, the, again, measure O is vital to the staffing model that we have right now. So the two positions that um, are freeze are from the current five um, SRL officers you currently have? That is correct. Or is, okay. And then the community service officer, uh, what is that role again? Uh, the role of the community service officer um, is basically it's a civilian uh, it's a civilian assignment, which uh, allows uh, our officers basically to be freed up for emergency calls. So the community service officer responds to traffic accidents. Uh, it, you know what we uh, uh, what we call cold burglaries uh, uh, or um, calls for service that you know have already happened. There's probably not uh, any suspect information. And, uh, but it allows our civilian, a civilian staff member to go out into the field to address those calls, take reports, uh, that sort of thing. And then also um, you stated you did the five um, listening sessions and I know there was some programming that was gonna come out of the five listening sessions. Um, do you have any of that available at this time? Could you be, I'm sorry, could you be more specific, Vice Chair? Um, I know you did the five listening sessions to get the community feedback, and I know there was some programming that was going to come out of the community feedback, and so is that where the low rider and the uh, ethics, is that what, yeah. what that arrived from? So those did come out of our uh, more recent community empowerment meetings uh, that we uh, worked on with uh, with the mayor and also the uh, office of community engagement and uh, the uh, but however the our measure O funds are not uh, are not being used for the low rider car uh, we do have an older vehicle uh, that uh, does not impact measure O that is uh, going to be leaving the fleet and. We are um, we, we're going to be basically looking. We're looking at ways to donate that car, um, and then uh, we're working with the Office of Community Engagement on uh, raising funds. Uh, right now, due to the uh, due to the resources that are needed, uh, Measure O is again vital for our staffing and um, essential uh, equipment for emergency and and. Um, uh, responding to uh, the community for a cost of service. Okay, and then my final question is in relation to um, the school resource, re resource officers. Um, if it continues to stay the way it is with the state of the schools, will they be repurposed into something else within the department? Will that still be, will those positions still be around? What does that look like? So for the remainder of the year, the, uh, the, the school resource officers are being reassigned to uh, patrol. Uh, they, still, they still take on um, a significant portion of the things that are going on right now with uh, COVID. They, again, they, they've been uh, dealing with uh, some of the business compliance uh, issues that we've had. Uh, they are helping us with uh, patrol staffing right now. And they are um, involved in the ethnic studies, studies with the cop. Um, if the uh, health emergency or the pandemic continues into the 
uh, the next school year, then we are addressing or we will be reevaluating uh, what needs to be done. And we're working uh, with the schools um, on that. But, uh, you know, most likely if there is no school, then uh, the, the officers are reallocated into some other areas uh, with potentially some of them uh, continuing to, to work on um, some of the current issues that we have. They still do get calls for service from the schools to address um, students and to, um, you know, that might be in crisis, uh, have a crisis issue or with uh, some of the school facilities that uh, may have problems uh, because they are uh, not being occupied right now. Um, I, that was that was going to be my last question, but not it's not. <laughs> so my next question <laughs> has to do with um, so in the event that this you know should happen, will that funding for the SROs will it still be coming out of the measure O? If they're repurposed into something else, will they would their um, payments and benefits salaries and benefits still come out of measure O? Uh, well, if they're we, we, we also use Measure O for officers or staff that are in patrol, such as the uh, field evidence technicians, uh, community service officers, and, I, and three patrol officers. So uh, again, the, for all of our staffing, you know, Measure O has been very beneficial in, in helping us enhance all of our services and calls, uh, responding to calls for service. So um, those positions would be reallocated back to patrol to uh, continue that. Without, without school resource officers uh, on campus, uh, what, uh, what uh, they, they, they do handle a lot of calls that would end up going to patrol um, in the first place. So they would continue to enhance our, um, our services uh, back in, in, the, in the patrol function. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chief Navarro, this is member staff. Um, First of all, thanks, thanks to you and to your teams for all you've done in a year when it seems like every single week there was a new large challenge to be undertaken. Um, you know, what a, what a last nine months or so. Um, in the report, you, um, or the report mentioned that there was, um, that there was a drop off in expenditures this year because we had done some, or the, the department had done some radio upgrades in past years um, and those expenses were not incurred this year. Um, my question is, are, are some of the infrastructure projects that we've talked about in these meetings in the past, in terms of radio upgrades, in terms of electrical upgrades, are some of, are those infrastructure projects just on hold right now? Um, are there, is the department looking for ways to push those forward? Yeah, again, we're going to have to continue to strategize as we move into the future on how we um, prioritize uh, the different uh, projects that we have. Um, and uh, again, you know, we, we're, we've got to figure out, you know, what, what happens with Measure O uh, as we move forward. But I think last year we talked a little bit about, you know, the, uh, the desire to uh, try to provide more uh, projects from an infrastructure model. Uh, right now, that's, it's going to be diff very difficult to do um, as in the area that we are right now. So it's going to be something we'll continue to look at uh, and, and prioritize based on uh, the uh, city priorities and the department priorities. But it, right now it is a little unclear. Um, and, um, you know, we, we did get the radio um, project done, uh, but right now we're looking at different strategies to address other facility improvements that we have um, that, uh, you know, if we have to stay in the uh, um, uh, facility, I, I, I anticipate we stay, we're going to be staying in our facility for some time. And we'll have to look at what that what the improvements are for there, um, as it's an aging facility. Understood. Thank you. Chief Navarro, this is Manza Atkinson here. Um, I'm curious as to what the uh, demographics of these nineteen funded positions are, ethnicity wise? Um, sir, I don't have those, um, the demographics on these particular positions, uh, but that is definitely something that we can uh, get and, and get back to, um, back to this committee on. 
we're actually, um, we did provide uh, a report out to the public safety subcommittee um, uh, or we have demographics on our on our department. I'd have to uh, look into that, but uh, we can get back to you on the 19 positions. Thank you. Uh, one more question that the 498 arrest, um, what were the nature of those arrests? And is that something that you take pride in? So the uh, arrests are just one, arrests and citations are, uh, those are the easiest way to kind of measure uh, what's, what um, the activity that goes on. Uh, I, I, you know, to be honest with you, if we can work our way out of a job, then um, by having a, uh, having a community and uh, uh, a city that doesn't have any crime, that would be great. But uh, the, the fact of it is we do have crimes that occur and uh, part of our job is to uh, uh, maintain safety and to address criminal um, activities that, that do occur. Um, I don't have the breakdown, but uh, our, our uh, arrests range from uh, misdemeanors all the way up to, um, to felonies. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's something that's, it's, an, it's a necessity that we um, have to take part in. Um, again, those are, the, uh, those are just uh, hard statistics uh, to, to be able to uh, show you uh, what, what isn't, what we can't often uh, measure is the amount of community outreach and engagement that we do, uh, such as working with hosts and all of the referrals that uh, don't, don't come into play when, um, when we're not making the arrests. Um, you know, the, those particular arrests, when you look at the number of calls for service that we uh, went to last year, which was uh, over 137,000 calls for service. And um, we had about, um, I think department-wide 9,000 arrests and 400 uh, plus are from the Measure O officers. Um, we do a lot more work than we do, than we do arrests. So um, it, it's, a, it's a statistic that we use. Uh, we're continuing to try to improve on how we uh, capture the information as far as engagement and, um, and, and all the other things that we're doing. Thank you. I actually had a, a question about the data on the arrests and citations as well. So I might as well just say it now since we're on that piece, um, which was just, yeah, in terms of what is tracked, I know that data is a challenge across all government agencies. It's not it takes a lot of work, um, but I'm wondering how much data is tracked here, like the outcomes of the arrest, whether or not they lead to charges, racial breakdowns of those, and citations in terms of, um, especially when there's citations with fines and fees attached to them, how often those are actually paid and collected upon. Uh, that is a great question. So um, we we basically can track our. It's easy to to find the number of arrests, number of citations, the number of calls for service that we go to. Um, a lot of the, um, the results uh, of, of our contacts when it comes to an enforcement action, uh, it, there, there could be some lag times because we have to wait. Um, a lot of that information um, is dealt with after it goes to court. Um, I don't have that readily available. It might be something that we can look at. Um, what I can tell you is next year, uh, we have been pushing very hard to uh, move up a, um, a program that is statewide. Um, it actually was a, um, it's called the RIPA Act. It's the Racial Identity Profiling Act of 2015. And uh, it requires all agencies to go and in, come into compliance by 2023 uh, to actually report out um, our stops, our enforcement stops, and uh, the demographics uh, relating to those stops. Uh, so the, to give you a quick update, the larger agencies such as Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, and the California Highway Patrol, uh, they had to start uh, reporting out, collecting and reporting out uh, a couple of years ago, and it goes by the size of the agency. Uh, we are required to begin uh, 
collecting data in 2022 and reporting out in 2023. Uh, what I've asked my staff and I've encouraged uh, the other chiefs and, and um, we, we have uh, collectively agreed uh, is to work on, uh, begin to collect the information uh, in January, 2021. So just a few months from now, so we can start reporting out in 2022. So we're, we're hopefully gonna be a year, uh, a year early in uh, providing that information. Uh, but there is a lot of work to do uh, with the Department of Justice to make sure that we can provide that. So we should have a little bit more clear information uh, uh, starting next year. I have a question. Yes. Um, I was wondering if there's any sort of like um, evidence processing backlogs, like I've heard of other jurisdictions that have rape kit backlogs or any other sort of, I guess, evidence related things that if we had more funding, we could process better, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, it does make sense. Uh, I can tell you that our uh, rape kits, uh, we, are, we do not have a backlog on rape kits. Uh, we, uh, we have a process in place that has been, uh, been working very well over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, we have uh, some of the, some of the uh, uh, other evidence that may come up with uh, significant crimes. You know, it, it depends on what's going on with the Department of Justice because we use their labs, you know, for um, for different purposes. So sometimes it's it's out of our hands. It's it's more of a um, the the capacity for um, for uh, the state. Uh, we do have uh, our field evidence technicians. They uh, we do have a few of them that can actually do fingerprint uh, identifications and verifications. Um, and so that is a, a huge benefit to us. Um, and then, um, you know, but uh, th things do cost money. So we do, uh, we, we have been uh, looking at uh, the need for additional funds to ensure that we, we can continue uh, the testing in the future. But right now we do not have a backlog. Thank you. Is that all the questions? Are those all the questions? It looks like it. Thank you, Chief, and um, all the work you do. Thank you. Okay, I guess it's my turn to call for public comment. We're now taking public comments on the 2019-20 Measure Out Annual Report. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in by telephone, please dial nine, star nine, excuse me, to raise your hand to our Zoom host. A countdown timer will appear for the convenience of the speaker and viewers. The first speaker will be acknowledged and invited to speak when the countdown begins. Please make sure to unmute yourself when you are invited to do so. Your microphone will be muted at the end of the countdown. At this time, I am seeing no hands raised and there was no email comments received. Okay, well then we don't have uh, any public comments. So I think that we're done, is that right? So you just need to move to approve and get a second and then I'll vote on approving the annual report. Oh, that's right. Okay, somehow I missed that. So we need to get, um, could someone like to make a motion to approve the acceptance of the report? I make a motion to approve the acceptance of the report. Okay, and someone would like to make a second? Is that Jim? Second. Okay, I think we have I saw, I, I saw Jim first and then Mark. Right, I think Jim Wischendorf went first, Mark, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. And you know, I'd like to thank everybody for all their attention and good questions. And, you just need to take a vote That's the, before you. Oh, we need to take a vote. I'm sorry, I forgot that part. Uh, I, just, 
I saw Jim first and then Mark. Right. I think Jim was in to point first, Mark. Sorry. Okay. I vote yes. <laughs> Do I need to ask for a vote? Is that my job? Yes. Okay. It's my job to ask for a vote. Who'd like to accept the report? Aye. Any no? Any? Any nays? Looks like we have everyone. Although Man Manza, did you vote yes to accept the report? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Looks like we have everyone. Just a reminder, you have to let the members know about um, staying on Measure O. Right. Would you like to talk about that, Shelly, or is there someone else who will do that? Sure, I could do that. So just for those members that uh, weren't here earlier, uh, Magdalena and Mark, I believe that your term is up at the end of this December. So if you would like to stay on, you will need to fill out um, new paperwork and reapply to be part of the Measure O subcommittee. Um, that's all handled through the clerk's office. So if you need information on that, you could contact me or Elisa, the recording secretary, if you don't know the clerk's um, email yourselves. Do we, do we also have to charm our respective council person? Or is um, it just the application? <laughs> I believe uh, you should um, talk to them, but usually, um, like I said earlier, we don't have that many um, people applying, so I, I don't think we've ever had to deny anyone, and Jim mentioned that um, he may not be on the council next year, so um, we'll, we may have at least one open spot, so. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I, if you'd like, I, what I can do is contact the... Uh, City clerk myself and then ask her to send out the information to all four of you. Would you like that? So I, so you don't have to contact her. I'll do it for you. Mark, is that okay with you? Oh, sure. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll have them send the information to you so you don't have, or I'll, shall I ask her to send it to me and then I'll send it out to you. Okay. Oh, you mean, is it, you're talking about the application information? Correct. Oh, well, I think, I think it was Shelly or somebody else already sent it to us. I've just been negligent. So I've, I've, I've got it. Oh, you have it. Okay. I thought yeah. I saw it and I, I've had so many, well, it doesn't matter. Everybody has so many emails right now, but okay. Well, great. I will um, then, but Magdalena, I will send it to you. Yeah. So, I mean, how does that work with, I have a new district um, uh, council person coming yeah. in. I mean, I, do they not appoint them anymore or how does that work? So the new council will come in, um, but they all can reappoint and unless they have somebody else in mind, um, <laughs> They will evaluate all the applications received and then go ahead and pick from there. So um, if your council member, if your current council member doesn't make it on the council, if another one doesn't have a, a member to appoint to this citizen's oversight, you can step in for them. Great. Okay, well, thank you to the staff and to everybody else. It's good to have two new members. I hope if you have any questions about what's going on, give me a call. I'll do my best to answer the the questions for you or fill you in on any information that maybe you need and Jim I you know 12 years of being on the citizens oversight committee is uh, yeoman's work so thank you so much for your service okay well thank you to the staff and to everybody else it's good to have two new members I hope if you have any questions about what's going on give me a call I'll do my best to answer them